Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for this marvelous occasion. It's been very exciting already and uh, lots of ideas bubbling around. And uh, when Gottfried invited me to, to come here, I said, uh, I don't know anything about rhythm. <laughs> and he says, that's OK, be creative. And uh, so I started thinking, what do I know about? Well, I know about timbre perception. I know about auditory scene analysis. And so maybe somehow I can pull those together and move them towards rhythm. And so I went and asked uh, Composer, a colleague of mine, John Rea, who's a fantastic orchestrator, and I says, well, does timbre have anything to do with the rhythm? He says, well, yeah. <laughs> so I figured, OK, well, I'll do this and try something out. So this is going to be a primarily a, a demo-based talk rather than a scientific talk, is what, which I usually do. Um, but it's, uh, and it's very speculative, but I think that's sort of why we're here anyway. So here we go. Um, there's not a whole lot of research that has been done in the Western tradition on the role of timbre and rhythm and meter perception, and uh, probably because uh, until like the late 19th uh, or 20th century, timbre has most often been assigned a sort of decorative role uh, in music rather than a structural role, which led people like Leonard Meyer to say it's a secondary non-syntactical parameter in music. I think this has obviously changed a lot in the 20th century in the Western uh, tradition. Um, but if you look at a lot of other cultures, timbre does play a much stronger role in the, the structuring patterns in, in music. And so I'll look at a few examples from that as well. So the issues I want to raise today have to do with uh, timbre perception itself, with auditory scene analysis, including both sequential and segmentational organization principles, and also a notion that we were starting to develop called timbral saliency. Uh, and how all of these affect both rhythm and, uh, and meter perception. Uh, so for example, we know that timbre can cause auditory stream segregation. If you've got sequences that are alternating between different timbres, if they're different enough, they will segregate into separate auditory streams. Uh, we also know that stream formation affects the perception of rhythm. So if I have a sequence playing along and I split all those things apart, I'm going to hear different rhythms than if they were all integrated together. So we know that stream segregation affects rhythm perception. We also know that contrasts in timbres, so if I'm playing wrong in some timbres and I switch to other timbres, that can create chunking, create segmentational boundaries in a musical surface. And we know that chunking can affect perception of both rhythm and meter through some of the work that uh, Povel and Essence has do have done. And finally, we know that timbre, some timbres are more salient. They sort of stand out or pop out uh, more than others do. Some work with a graduate student of mine, Song Hee Chun. And it appears that salient, tam salient sounds generally appear accented. And accented sounds, of course, affect rhythm and meter perception. And uh, we've known this since the days of uh, Paul Frasse. And so uh, the big question here then, what timbres are perceived as salient in the metric structure may depend on various kinds of cultural schemas and learned correlations that are uh, correlated with other kinds of sources of meter induction. And I'll come back to this notion of the sort of cultural aspects of what salient sounds actually create uh, strong beats in meter perception and so on. Now concerning timbre and stream segregation, we know that sounds coming from the same sound source tend to be fairly similar in timbre, and that sounds with very different timbres tend to come from different sound sources. So this means that perceptual organization that is trying to organize the world into sound sources and their behavior through time are going to tend to connect sounds that have similar timbres similar pitches, similar position in space, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, we also know that rhythm is computed within a stream. So once I've segregated things into various streams, the rhythms I hear, each stream has its own rhythm. Okay? So stream segregation gives rise to a grouping, and from that grouping, then, rhythm is computed. So the quality of rhythm belongs to a stream. And so if you segregate things into different streams, you're going to have different rhythms on the different streams. So, timbre differentiation that causes stream segregation within sequences will affect rhythm perception. Okay, so this is just based on the, the knowledge that we have. So, <clears throat> here's an example of what we call a timbre space. Okay, when we ask people to make judgments of similarity or dissimilarity between timbres, and then we put those into a mathematical model called multidimensional scaling, which then puts things in, in the space where the distance is monotonically related to the dissimilarity that people perceived. And this one here it has two different dimensions. One is a sort of a timbral brightness dimension, and the other is the attack sharpness dimension. So you'll notice that we have primarily um, 
sounds that are plucked and struck over here and sounds that are blown and bowed over here. And we have darker sounds here and brighter sounds on the top. Now, all the black and gray ones come from a space that was developed by Steve Lucados in 2000, reanalyzed by myself. And I've added in a few other sounds in red that uh, sort of come from a space by uh, Iverson and Krumhansel, or based on a certain number of intuitions that I have about where these go. And all the ones that are in black and red I'm going to be using in the examples I'm going to play for you today. So what we're interested in is how does the relative relations among all these timbres affect our ability to organize things into sound streams. Now, what I'm going to use as a basis of example is a piece that was written by Robert Erickson in 1972 and 73, and uh, you see San Diego. Uh, Erickson created a piece called uh, New Loops for Instruments, and it's basically just a repeating monodic pattern, a five-note pattern that changes into a six-note pattern, and he goes on and does this for various kinds of uh, transformations of the pitch pattern, but then he's going to organize it differently by the kinds of instruments that he has playing it. And he started off with basically six instruments. So you can see they have a sort of a, a moderate spread or degree of differentiation within this whole timbre space here. Okay, So that was the starting point. But what I wanted to do was to take his piece and reorchestrate it in a number of ways, controlling how close or how far apart all the timbres are that are actually alternating through these sequences. And so I'm going to start with one example, which is only played by the clarinet, so a single timbre. So we have the monotambral version, where the pitch organization should be primary. We'll have another one where they're all very close together, so it's just all the same patterns are played by, in the same register, by violin, viola, cello, and contrabass. So slight timbral differences, but all still very close together in the space. Moving on to one where it's primarily woodwinds, and brass instruments, so moderately different, still not as big as the difference that uh, Erickson actually had, but still a bit spread out in the, the team here. And then finally, uh, another version where I'm going to have woodwinds, brass, and bowed and struck strings. So now we're really sort of actually having bigger differences than Erickson had in his original piece. So here are the first four sections of that piece. As you can see, it's just a monodic pattern, a five note pattern that's repeating going on here, and it repeats and repeats and repeats. He wrote it sort of in 4-4, four four so people could actually organize their activity among the different players. But then what you have to do on this five-note repeating pattern, he in section A, he's got it going between timbre 1, timbre 2, timbre 3, timbre 1, timbre 2, timbre 3. So it's going 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, against the pattern of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, in the pitches. So the timbre series and the pitch series are out of phase in a certain sense, and they come back together after I guess three times five would be 15 notes, okay? Then in section B, he's now got a pattern that's going one, two, three, five, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, five, so four timbre against the five pitch. In section C, it's now one, two, three, four, five, two, one, two, three, four, five, three, one, two, three, four, five, two. So he's got like a double six note pattern with one little variation in it, again against the five note pattern. And then in section D, we now have a six note pitch pattern because we add in the C here, but now he's got a, the five, it's all standing between five of the timbres. So now we have a five timbre pattern against a, a six pitch pattern. And the various versions I'm going to look at are, as I said, the clarinet one. So it plays clarinet in all of these, OK? And what I'll play for you now is the clarinet, but I'm just going to play section A and section D because B and C are identical to A. And that would be a little bit boring, and I don't have time. So here's just the clarinet one. No. Come back. What's going on here? Play the clarinet for me, please. I'm not hearing anything. That's weird. It worked a minute ago. Okay, it's just the play uh, bar is appearing over the It's counting. So you can hear that five repeating pattern and the six repeating pattern. Now let's do a version that's basically based on the string. So it starts off with violin, viola, and cello. 
and then it's going to add in the contrabass for the four pattern and then second violins for the five pattern in both C and D. So you're getting some little fluctuations, but the timbre is not reorganizing the pitch in this particular case. Now let's take the next one, where we start off in bassoon, trumpet, and clarinet, then we're going to add in the English horn, and then we're going to add in the French horn in section C. Uh -huh. I hate Microsoft. Now you hear the three. Okay, so you're getting some cases where it's splitting apart on some, and you've got a sort of a, an ambiguity there when this middle range group between the pitch organization and the timbre organization. Now let's take timbre way out, so we're going to start with violin, piccolo, trumpet, bassoon, and then we're going to add in the flute, and then we're going to add in the piano in this particular case. <laughs> case the pitch organization is completely lost and even you can't follow the timbre organization in the last one because they're all sort of separate. You hear these individual little streams with their own different rhythms which correspond to the different instruments. So here's a case where the timbre organization of the exact same sequence has completely changed our rhythm perception of that particular sequence. Um, let's move on now to the notion of how repeating timbral patterns can actually create rhythm. We know uh, from music that uh, sort of a sense of what Laredo might have called parallelism. If you have a pattern that repeats, the actual repeating itself creates a kind of a, a rhythmic structure that we can pick up on. Um, so we have a kind of a segmentation that happens through parallelism or through repetition. And we know that regular segmentation can create a grouping structure which then establishes in this sort of tactus that's going on very rapidly a kind of a first level of metric structure. So I want to play a few examples of it here, one with no structure whatsoever because it's just the same timbre uh, that's playing it. Although some of you might be hearing it in twos or threes according to Paul Fress's notion of subjective accents. Six, okay, well, <laughs> why not? Okay, now what I'm going to do is to introduce a very subtle alternation between the timbres. It's the same note being played by an E-flat clarinet and a bass clarinet on the same pitch, but there's going to be slight timbral differences. Hello? What's going on there? Oh. Sorry, go back. Would somebody write Microsoft and tell them to stop doing this? <laughs> now the question is, where did you hear 
the on and what was down and what was up for that particular case. Okay, pay attention to that. We're going to come back to this particular notion. Now, a ternary pattern. No, that's the other one, so. Come on, give me this one, thank you. I'm hearing it on uh, that particular note there. So on the three note pattern, we have basically English horn, clarinet, and bassoon. And uh, some people seem to focus on the English horn, some people tend to focus on the bassoon. So some of these timbres are sort of standing out a little bit and making it be the ones that are the beginning of the cycle for you. Now, I'm going to take this binary pattern, a binary pattern that's played with a, an oboe and a trumpet, so alternating between that. And superimposed on top of that is going to be this ternary pattern that you just listened to. And what I want you to see is if you can actually pick up this kind of hemiola three against two kind of pattern through the timbral alternations that are superimposed. Is that the right one? No, that's not the right one. I want this one right here. Thank you. No. Come on. Come on. All the way over here. I can't see the screen. It's so small here. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip the quintuplet because we're running a little bit short on time here. But you can actually hear this sort of a, a double kind of rhythm going on, a polyrhythm with a two and a three happening at the same time, just through timbral changes, even though there's no pitch differences. Now again, with, uh, I want to come back to this notion of saliency. Um, here's a, a, a similar kind of ternary pattern alternating between E flat, B flat, and bass clarinets. Okay, and the question here is, which one are you hearing as the sort of stronger beat uh, in this? I'm hearing the one where I was indicating with my hand, which is the bass clarinet, which has a, it's a slightly more different than the other two are. So I think there's a case where the three different colors there, there's one that's slightly more different than the other two, and we tend to focus on that. So now what I'm going to do is take the, uh, this particular one and I'm going to replace it with a different timbre, which is more different than the two that were already there. I'm going to replace the E-flat clarinet with an English horn. So that we'll then have a pattern that looks like this. So now the bass clarinet's no longer the strong one, it's now the English horn because it's more different than the other two. And let's go one further step. I'm now going to replace the B flat clarinet with a, a trumpet sound. And now the trumpet picks it up for me, and that's the one that has the strong notes, so it follows right there. Um, now you can do, I'm going to skip this next example. You can use timbre to actually create rhythmic effects. And this is done a lot with wah-wah pedal and electric guitar, and also with a wah-wah mute in jazz. I can play for you this afterwards. This is from Voodoo Child by uh, Jimi Hendrix. Um, but I want to move on now to talk about culturally defined rhythmic metric structures that might be based on timbre. And one of the classic examples is Indian tabla music. Uh, with uh, the talls, somebody's already talked about the talls here. They're sort of rhythmic cycles of a fixed length with various kinds of subgroupings in them. And within those subgroupings, you have stronger and weaker subgroups, which is called the tali-kali patterns of the claps and waves. So that in the case of the uh, uh, teen tall, for example, it has 16 beats that organize four, 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 and you have four, two strong ones, and then a weak one, and then another strong one again. And these are all based on uh, various timbral patterns. These uh, talls are then realized uh, in sound with the bowls, and this is called a teka, the particular pattern that is done. And these bowls involve both the uh, bass tabla, the bayan, and the more treble tabla, the, the dayan. And in particular, what we find in the teen tal is that you have all of these sounds with the, the aspirated dh here, all involve hitting both drums, so they include the bass drum, 
whereas on the wave cycle of this, it goes away and you only have the treble drum. So the absence of the bass is creating this lighter one and it's this alternation between the bass present and the bass absent, which is actually creating something that somebody who knows these things will actually be able to situate themselves within the longer uh, metric cycle here. So I just want to play that example for you right here. Uh, this is a demonstration done by uh, Sean Matavetsky, who teaches tabla at, at McGill. Do we need to come up with a little bit? So a quintal, 16 beats, 4, 4, 4, 4, clap, clap, wave, clap. So that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, la, din, din, da, da, din, din, da, da, tin, tin, na, na, din, din, da, da, din, din, da. So here the basic idea is that these patterns allow for uh, listeners that are enculturated to this music to situate themselves within the metric cycle. They can walk in the room in the middle of the thing and still know where you, they are within this whole metric cycle. And there's a couple of things. One is that you can pick up the beat pattern with what's going on in the right hand with the na, tin, tin, na, okay, and that's repeating. Uh, Westerners would probably hear that as being offbeat. They would want to group the two that are the same as being first, and the other two is the same as being second, where it's actually sort of a ding dong dong, ding ding dong dong in the, in the Indian tradition here. And also, the, the bit, main point is you would have to know the whole structure of the teka to actually know how to situate yourself within that. So that cultural knowledge would be necessary to actually use this timbre pattern to actually situate yourself within it. Uh, similar kinds of things exist in the Western world in jazz and rock drum beats. Okay, where you've got sort of the, in the, the swing on the top, you've got the on the ride cymbal with the hi-hat on two and four, for example, or a similar case on the bottom where you've got the bass drum on one and three and the snare drum on two and four and the ride cymbal uh, sort of doing the tactics at the eighth level thing. And one of the fascinating things here, talking about what Mark Schmilly was talking about the other day about how do you know whether claps are telling you something, in this kind of thing, depending on what culture you come from, even though you know it's uh, one, two, three, four, in the, in the North American world, it's going to be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we're not tapping on one and three. But then if you play this same music and you go to France, and this always used to drive me crazy, I went to hear a gospel group once, and the gospel people want everybody to clap along, and so those of us from North America were going one, two, three, four, and all the French people were going one, two, three, four, one. So you had a sort of this hocket between the North Americans and the French that was happening there. Uh, so there's, there are cultural things that are involved there. The clapping may not tell you necessarily the meter. There might be cultural patterns that are learned that are associated with certain sides of styles and so on and so forth. Uh, similar kinds of things exist here in Thai classical music. You have uh, one of the, the timekeepers in Thai classical music are the little finger symbols called the Ching, and they basically alternate between a damped one, so you hit them together and you leave them together, or you let them ring. And so you get the damp is on the strong beat and the ring is on the off beat, and then that gets reinforced by a gong that comes along simultaneously with the damped beat at certain times. So you can see these patterns of zeros and pluses and so on are actually indicating this, and that varies as a function of the actual tempo you're playing. So here again is another timbral kind of pattern which is underlying the metric structure of this particular kind of music. Similar things exist in gamelan and so on and so forth. So just to wrap up here, we've seen that timbre space uh, can be a kind of predictive model of timbre relations that affect both stream segregation and contextual saliency because relative difference between one timbre and others can create accent effects and so on and so forth. We see that timbre can affect stream segregation and that rhythms are computed on auditory streams, therefore timbre changes and differentiation can affect rhythm in that way. Timbre can be created, uh, timbral patterns can create segmentation, so there it affects both rhythm and meter in, in very important ways. And then both intrinsic and contextual timbral saliency can create the accents, which of course are very important for the perception both of 
the feel of a rhythm pattern and of reinforcing metric patterns and so on. And finally, there are culturally determined roles of timbre properties that are involved in meter induction that can be related to both intrinsic saliency or a cultural learning of these patterns and probably some kind of a combination between the two. Thank you very much.